Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Into the Lion's Den here on the Heavy Hitter Network. I'm your host, as always, Mario Romanelli, getting ready to take you on a ride through the recap of what was week 10 of the NFL season. Also going to be taking a look at the uh, what is to play out here in week 11, the matchups we got, the uh, implications it could have as teams are really trying to make a run for the playoffs at this point. Some teams have not a chance in hell, but some are some are still fighting for one. So we will take a look at all that. Of course, we'll go over the updated power rankings. We'll also look at the standings, where teams are laying right now, and if they even have a chance at this point, or if the window has officially closed, in my opinion. So we're going to get into all of that. Uh, very excited to be here. Real quick off the top, before I forget, I got to hit you guys up with one thing here. Uh, I did a show on Saturday. And if you go to Rumble, HH Network, just like it looks there, and you can see the Santa Claus as the featured video, I highly recommend you guys go check that video out. It's called Red Dot Truth Hammer of Justice. And if you guys uh, are in the political realm and maybe you voted for a certain DJT, then I think you will definitely uh, be informed on this. And you know what? Even more important, if you didn't vote for DJT, you might want to check this out and find out why so many did. So that's Donald Trump in a Santa Claus suit. There is a tie to why that makes sense. If you go to the show, you'll find out why. And um, I can tell you the show banned on YouTube. Uh, it wasn't even this show. It was actually the Red Wave show down here that I did was banned on YouTube. Um so this one I didn't even attempt to put on YouTube because I knew that one was going to get banned for sure. But again, it's Red Dot Truth Hammer of Justice. Definitely go check that out. Uh, it's one of the most important shows I think I've ever put out. And I've put out some big ones. I put out you know one back in the day about COVID when that first was rolling out and, and what to uh, think of that. And uh, that's, that's a show that I always stood by and said, I'm so proud I did that one. Well, this one right up there with it. Uh, definitely gets into some dark, dark topics, which is, uh, again, why I didn't even try and pass it along to YouTube, because I knew this one will never see the light of day. You can go to Rumble, or you can go to uh, po heavypodcast.com, www.heavypodcast.com, and find it at those two locations. That's the only place you're going to find them. Um, so, yes, definitely, please, please, please go check that out. And uh, I think you will have your eyes maybe opened a little bit, maybe even eyes you didn't want opened, but it's so important that the message gets out that uh, I definitely had to do a little promo for that one. Uh, now let's talk about how you guys can and uh, participate with this show or really any show that we do. Um, it's all the same contacts. So first off the top, like I said, you can go to our website, heavypodcast.com right there. Uh, all the all the channels are there in one spot. Uh, heavy Hitter Entertainment, Heavy Hitter Sports, uh, Xtreme, and Heavy uh, Hitter Freedom Network. All up there in one spot. If you want to reach out to us for any reason, questions, comments, concerns, you can contact us through email, heavyhitterspodcast at gmail.com, or you can call the hotline one 616 Two five eight six three eight six. Again, any show that you're looking to comment on, ask a question on, you can contact those areas. All I would say is if you're writing an email in the subject line, put the show that you're asking about. Um, that way it'll just make it to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be able to know which show I'm answering to quicker for a quicker response. And then uh, the hotline, same thing. Just call out which show you're uh, calling about and then we always want to know where you guys are from just to know how far the reach is and then along the left side here you can see on rumble we are hh network youtube we are heavy hitter network twitch we are hh network and kick we are hh network so the twitch and kick are strictly for uh the video game streaming that we do uh need to get back up on there here pretty soon again the the the, the busyness has slowed down a little bit because baseball playoffs are done <laughs> and now the election is done. But surprisingly, after the election, I think I've actually got more to talk about on Red Dot Truth than even before. So kind of crazy there. 
And then Heavy Hitter Network, I always caution you guys, if you guys are YouTubers, that's fine. But just know you are not getting everything that this network puts out because YouTube loves to block us, okay? While you're at any of these uh, spots, please like, share, and comment on the videos. Even if it's just a thumbs up on the video, it's still a comment in the comment section that helps the algorithms go up, which means our, vi our videos have more reach. It's that simple, it's free, it's easy, and it's so very, very valuable for me. And then of course, if you like what I'm doing on any of the shows, you can always tip the host by going to Venmo at Mario Romanelli, or you can just scan the QR code right here on the right hand side, and that will take you right to the tip option. Once again, your three options, if you're just stumbling upon this video because maybe it was in a link somewhere, somebody shared it on a message board, whatever it is, the actual place you can go to watch our videos, Rumble, HH Network, YouTube, Heavy Hitter Network, or, that's right, the website, www.heavypodcast.com. That is the one I'm recommending the most, just because, like I said, it is my one-stop shop for all the content I put out. And then while you're there, like, share, and comment. All right, now, content time. Heavy, heavy content. Let's get into it. NFL Week 10. It, of course, started out on Thursday night with the Cincinnati Bengals taking on the Baltimore Ravens. Bengals, who got off to a slow start this season, looking to get back into the playoff picture. And boy, they had their eyes on a perfect opponent, the Baltimore Ravens, the hottest team in the AFC North. They had to travel to go see them, but it was the right time at the right place. The Bengals have been playing really good ball lately. And uh, Baltimore, look, they're just they're, they're staying hot. So you just know you're running into a uh, a buzzsaw when you're when you're going to be playing the Ravens. As you can see, the Baltimore Ravens came in five and a half point favorites in this one. The Baltimore Ravens do not cover the spread, but they do get the all important win. In the last two weeks, the Bengals have combined for 75 points. They've had 679 passing yards, only one interception, and nine passing touchdowns. But yet their record after those two weeks is just one and one. The Bengals suffered a frustrating loss on Thursday uh, for many reasons. First, anytime you're in a high-scoring game like this, and, and you don't get the win, that's that's that hurts. I mean, you put up a lot of points, a lot of yards, a lot of positive things on offense, but you just can't find a way to win. That's, that's a problem. Uh, then, when you're playing your division rival, who you're trying to catch in the standings, and you're leading by 14 points midway through the third quarter, you would think that's going to be a win. You've basically controlled this this big, bad Baltimore Ravens high-power offense through three and a half quarters. At that point, you've held the Ravens to just 158 yards of offense through basically three quarters. But in the end, you have a one, one little hiccup. Chase Brown fumbles. Big fumble. <laughs> big fumble. It led to a quick score by Baltimore, got them back in the in the game, gave them a, a little boost of energy. What do I always talk about? Momentum. Yes, it gave them the momentum shift. But let's just skip to the heart of the matter in this game. Both defenses, I thought, played atrocious. Both defenses, poor tackling. And that's really how we got 34 to 35. Like I say, early on, yeah, Bengals, good job, whatever. Problem is, this game is four quarters. And it is so important to have a strong four quarters. It's great to have a first, uh, uh, you know, a, ooh, we had a really good opening first quarter. Doesn't matter. Or, hey, we were up a half. Doesn't matter. What did you do at the end of the four quarters? Did you play a complete game? The, the Bengals had every opportunity to walk away with a win in this game. And their lack of wrapping up tackles, 
stopping on third downs, uh, and then, of course, not turning the ball over, all failed late in this game. And it, it just compounded to the Ravens getting back into it. We talked about how, how high power, how dangerous this Ravens team is. You can shut them down for three quarters. That's fine. Good job. But they can kill you in the fourth quarter. They can kill you in one quarter of the game. They can alter the ending. And that's really what happened. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Because at the end, the Bengals had a chance to go for the win. Or they had a chance to go for the tie. They decide to go for the win. Now, that right there will give some questions, right? That'll give some pause to, is that the right decision? Do you go for the win there? You're on the road. You're in a hard-fought game. You probably don't feel like your defense at this point can stop the, the Ravens. But still, do you just play for the opportunity? I would think you would play for the opportunity just to take this thing into overtime and, and, and see if you can win the coin toss. Because let's be honest, their defense hasn't done crap of stopping you either. So it really does come down to a coin toss, but I like the chances of a coin toss. And even at worst case, you lose a coin toss, giving your defense a chance to make a play for once versus it's all or nothing on this two-point conversion. To me, it just you have more options. You have more things that can go right by taking that thing to overtime than you do by going for two points on the play it was really bad there was multiple penalties that could have been called in this game that the refs completely missed again and what is it with the referees constantly missing penalties in big games let's take a look at it right here it says uh re Marav from My Sports Update says the Ravens got away with a defensive holding and a roughing the passer on the failed two point conversion. Terry McCauley said on the broadcast, Well, here's the pass interference or holding, whatever you want to call it, right here. You can see he's already made contact and the ball is still way up here. Here, that's a complete hold. Absolutely. I mean, has a hold of his jersey. Uh, he just get, and this guy actually comes in and holds too. So both of them, and then the one he didn't even call out, which I saw on the replay, was this one, and this one, hands to the face, hands to the face, hitting the quarterback's head. I mean, it's all of it. So again, if we zoom in on just this one, again, you can see the contact is already made. So he's going to alter his body position from making that catch, which is right there. Now, some people say, was it a catchable ball? This was such an egregious one. I don't even think it matters, to be honest. But if we want to check that one off and say, okay, that wasn't even a catchable ball. Okay, well, how about this hold? <laughs> how about this one? How about the one where the guy literally basically just gets tackled almost by these two guys i mean they, they sandwich them so he's definitely taken out of the play and then i think the worst most egregious one is this side by side you've got two penalties and somehow the refs miss those ones too hands to the face hitting the quarterback in the head Either one? You want to call either one? No? Okay. All right. So, look, I get why the Bengals would be upset at this point with that play. I do. I'm sick and tired of these NFL referees constantly missing plays or calling plays that are really, really ticky-tack calls to advance what seems to be just an elite few teams in the NFL at crucial moments. But here's my th thoughts for the exact reasons that I talked about why I would have rather tied this thing up and gone into overtime. You've got more options because if something like this happens here where they miss a big call, it's a big deal. 
especially when it's all or nothing. And that's exactly what happened. It's kind of like a, a, a baseball player, a hitter, being up there with two strikes. I'd always rather go down swinging than, than hoping the umpire doesn't make a bad call. If you're leaving it in the umpire's hands, the referee in this case, hands, you're playing with fire. Like you, you've got a, a really, you basically got a 50 50 chance that this guy doesn't mess it up. And in this case, they had four opportunities on one play to make a call, and none of them decided to make the call. And it's at all different spots of the field, basically. These two are side by side, but the previous two, different parts of the field, you got different eyes looking at it. And they all missed it. Numbers that matter in this one. First downs from penalties, Bengals, four penalties that advanced their options on offense by getting first downs. So Baltimore, again, has had issues with penalties. I've called them out quite a few weeks for that. It continues in this one. Fourth down efficiency. Uh, you can see the Bengals. Two for four on fourth downs. 75 plays total they ran on offense. 470 yards of offense. They were three for three in the red zone. Ravens were four for four. Fumbles lost. They did lose the one fumble, which I talked about. Chase Brown, that was a big deal because the Ravens would end up scoring seven points off of that fumble. So again, you want to look at just a couple things that happened in this game for the Bengals that went wrong. The Chase Brown fumble. Uh, the fact that basically the Ravens got one more trip to the red zone because it literally came down to they both were making their trips to the red zone count. The Ravens just got one more than they did. And of course, the missed penalties by the referees. Uh, the Ravens actually a little bit of a struggle on the running game. You can see just 99 yards on the day. That's that's actually good to hold them under 100. And I know it's right there, but still, even to, you know, 110, 115, it seems like nowadays would be a good number to hold the Ravens to because they just run all the time on people. And uh, 99 yards is what they got held to. So they had to find other ways in this one. And again, it kind of was a ugly, gritty win for the Ravens in a lot of ways. But at the end of the day, good teams find ways to win. And the Ravens found a way to win. And we can call it on the referees because that is absolutely blatant. Now, are we going to say, had the refs called that, the Bengals absolutely 100% would have scored? We can't say 100%. So we still don't know if they altered the game. You would think the chances would have been really, really good at that point. That Yes, they probably would have scored. But unfortunately, we can't say 100%. But what we can say is there was a lot of opportunities for the Bengals to win the game, whether it be stopping them on a third down, um, whether it be stopping them in the red zone, holding them to three points. I mean, you just look back on all of that and say there was plenty of opportunities other than just a two-point conversion that the Bengals could have found a way to win this game. And they didn't. So it's a tough loss. They go to four and six. The Ravens now improve to seven and three. And the Bengals will have to just try and figure out something for next week on defense. Because that's what let them down. That is 100% what left them down in this one. Uh, Baltimore's defense did put pressure on Burrow all night long. Uh, they ended up getting three sacks and 13 quarterback hits. So they were putting the pressure there. The, the only thing about Baltimore's defense, and I think it's really been all season long, they need to learn to tackle better. There's a lot of bad plays where they're just missing tackles. Matter of fact, there was a, uh, a short pass to Tylon Wallace that broke out to be an 84-yard touchdown on that play alone. And this all this was was a short little maybe, I don't know, maybe seven-yard pass it seemed like 
wasn't long at all. But it broke for an 84-yard pass because the Ravens missed three tackles on that play alone. Three tackles. Any one of them could have got him, stopped him, knocked him out of bounds. Nothing. And, and that's the kind of stuff that you just can't have. Like I say, Baltimore, I think, is absolutely on a way to uh, possibly go to the Super Bowl again this year. I like their team better than Kansas City. I get it. Kansas City's undefeated. But if you really stack these two teams against each other, I do think Baltimore um, has a lot more firepower. But the problem is Kansas City's got a better defense. And when you're missing tackles like this against Kansas City, Kansas City has enough firepower to then beat you. And I think Kansas City's defense has been pretty consistently badass all season long. There are a lot of the times why Kansas City is remaining undefeated because of what their defense does. So, yeah, Baltimore's got to tighten this up. They've got to figure it out, and they've got to stop having so many damn penalties. 11 penalties for 81 yards? That is not championship-caliber football. That's going to get you caught up, and it almost did in this one. And that would have been a big win for the Bengals. And I know the Bengals have to be feeling really bad about this one now, losing it, because... They knew they had an opportunity here to get a win against Baltimore on the road. I mean, a lot of good vibes come from that. And they missed out. Let's go to the Sunday morning game, which was from Munich, Germany. It was the New York Giants 2-7 and seven, taking on the 2-7 and seven Carolina Panthers. Giants came in five-point favorites. Not sure why, but they did. And you can see that by game time, it actually moved up to six and a half point favorites, and they did not cover. <laughs> I honestly, look, the Giants are, if not the worst team in football, because we've got some ugly ones, they're definitely in the running for it. And uh, I think this proved it big time that the Panthers beat them. The Panthers, for the longest time on the power rankings, was ranked 32. They were in the basement for a long time. They finally moved out of the basement. I think they're going to move farther out of the basement this week. But it was nice to see the joy on Bryce Young's face at the end of this game. And I'm being serious. I'm not trying to be snarky or anything. Look, Bryce Young's had a tough, tough uh, game, season, whatever you want to call it, career so far. Um, he's had it rough. He really has. And for him to uh, be able to enjoy a win, especially on a game like this, like, you know, everybody's watching. It's a nationally televised game because it's the only game on at that time. You're going to another country to kind of just get away from the noise that he's probably hearing at home on the road. You know, everybody knows what's going on with his career so far. The Germany's not really that aware. And he comes out and look, does he sparkle? I don't know if he sparkles, but you know what he does do is he keeps his team in this game. He doesn't have any turnovers, and he sees a win. And that's that's what I enjoyed for him. Because, again, you could just see the joy and probably the relief, to be honest, that he was able to have from this game. And he can give a lot of credit to uh, Chuba Hubbard. 153 yards on 28 carries, a touchdown, had four other uh, catches as well for 16 yards. He did lose a fumble, but luckily it didn't It didn't cost him in this one. Jill and Coker, again, I remember when this guy first kind of had his breakout game, I was like, you know, they could go, you, go to him more. It seems like they are. It seems like there's definitely something there uh, to build on with Jill and Coker. Three catches, 41 yards in this one. But as you can see, the player of the game... For me, Josie Jewell, six tackles, one tackle for a loss, two passes defended, one interception, and a fumble recovery. That was the key to this game. Opportunities given and opportunities taken away. And that's what he did. Now, let's talk about Daniel Jones. When does it end? When do we stop? <laughs> when do we stop having this guy be the starting quarterback? Now, 
I think it's coming very, very close because I heard uh, something this week that Daniel Jones is approaching something with a contract status. I don't know exactly what it is. I think it's something to do with basically games played, time played, maybe something like that. But there's something that I believe kicks in if they don't put a stop to it pretty quick. Like he's going to come into a, I don't know if it's a contract extension or more money or whatever, but there's something that's about to trigger on his contract that made me think, oh yeah, the Giants are going to be sitting him pretty soon. And they really need to. Like they look, not just for the fact that I think the Giants could get a couple more wins if they didn't have Daniel Jones in there. I don't know if they can or not. And it really at this point doesn't matter. Their season's done. But my thing is, have you not come to the realization by now that Daniel Jones is not your quarterback of the future? Because if you have come to that realization, I think it's worth your time and your efforts to throw in the rest of the quarterbacks you got on this roster and see if any of them even have a twinkle of future quarterback. And if they don't, then you go know, you know going into next season, we got to replace them all. You know what I mean? Like, at some point, you've just got to test what you've got. Just do a test run with all of them and see if there's a flash of anything that looks usable at all. Because we've seen enough Daniel Jones. I've seen Daniel Jones enough for probably the last two years. I mean, I've been calling for Daniel Jones's head for a long time. This guy never looked amazing to me. He never looked like a quarterback. Because here's my thing. You want to know how I judge quarterbacks? It's very easy. Do you feel like you're going to win a championship with that quarterback? No. Daniel Jones has never given me those vibes. Never. You know what? Drake May gives me, a, gives me more championship vibes at this point than Daniel Jones. And that's not a knock on Drake May. What it's saying is Drake May has had a little window and I've got confidence that that guy's winning a, a Super Bowl at some point in his career. Just because you can see a lot of the tangibles, you can see how he plays in big moments. Sure, he makes some knucklehead, you know, interceptions right now. Those are excusable because of the lack of experience that he's got. That will that will absolutely fix itself. But there's a lot of ways that he manages the game, how he carries himself, the poise in the pocket, all that that you see. And I'm sorry, with Daniel Jones, I just see a very low-ranking quarterback that should definitely not be a number one on anybody's roster. You want him for a backup quarterback? Absolutely. I think he could manage at times when you need to throw a backup in. Sure, maybe he could he could work that kind of a, a, a game for you. But to give him the keys and say, hey, go take us to a championship, you're never going to get there. You're going to take the wrong exit. It's just not going to be a good thing. So, yeah, that was a problem there. Two interceptions by him. Uh, Tyrone Tracy had a fumble. It just it was a bad game for the Giants. Now, was it a winnable game for the Giants? Yeah, it probably was. Probably should have been. Because, look, the Panthers have a lot of issues, too. But what I said about the Panthers, I, I stand by. I think they at least have pieces that are starting to come together, starting to gel. Bryce Young, yes, didn't didn't put up huge numbers where a fantasy, you know, aficionado would have been happy with his points that he put up. But from a football standpoint, a real football standpoint, I think he did a great job. Completed 15 or 25 passes, 126 yards, had a touchdown, didn't turn the ball over, and added two carries for 30 yards. He made things happen. He gave his team a chance to win, and they went out and they found a way. More through defense than offense, but who cares? It doesn't matter. As long as you're getting the win at the end of the day, it's good. And so with that, the Panthers have now won three games. And I say that kind of surprised. I did not think the way the Panthers season started that they were going to get to three wins, but they have. And now we kind of see some regular contributors on offense where it tells me they're starting to gel a little bit. They're starting to get a little comfortable 
What can this team do down the stretch? And again, for this team, look, you're not thinking playoffs at this point. And I don't think you were when the when you were in week one, to be honest. But you're definitely not now. But what you are thinking is, how strong can we finish a season? Because if we can finish this season strong, that's going to carry over to next season of how we come out and how we feel about ourselves. And for Bryce Young, this will be a great opportunity to build confidence, chemistry, and just to get the fans to believe in him. So he's got an opportunity. This season is definitely not a lost season for the Panthers, but from this point on, it's a season to prove. It's a season to show. And so we'll see. I'm interested to watch the Panthers the rest of the season and see what they do do. See if Bryce Young can hold on to the starting quarterback position now and see if his numbers do start to increase with the output. See if Jalen Coker is his number one weapon. You know what I mean? And then Chuba Hubbard just signed a new contract. So he's locked in now for the long term with the Panthers. And he's a consistently good running back. Very good. So that's a main piece that now, if Chuba can keep doing what he's doing, and Bryce Young knows, like, hey, I don't have to do this alone. I've got a running, a running game. I've got a defense that can make plays. All of a sudden, that confidence starts to go. And I'm telling you, confidence and momentum in football is very, very important. And that doesn't show up anywhere on the stat sheet. But when you got it, it's a big deal. And so let's just watch and see what the Panthers do. Again, can't say they're amazing right now. It's the Giants that they beat, for God's sakes. They only beat them by three points. But my, my takeaway with this is, they found a way to close, and that is also a big part of football. Can you close the game? Numbers that matter in this one, you can see the two interceptions by the Giants played into a big part of this. Carolina, for everything I just complimented them for, they still need to get better and more disciplined. Ten penalties, lost them 87 yards. They are lucky they're playing the Giants. But if you want to look at why bad teams lose, you can usually start with penalties and turnovers. And once again, Panthers limited the turnovers, but boy, they did not limit the penalties. And then last but not least, to close this one out, first back-to-back -back wins for the Panthers <laughs> since weeks 12 and 14, they had a week in, uh, bye in week 13 of that season. So weeks 12 and 14, they had win-win. Last time they've done a win-to-win -win since back then in 2022. 2022. So it's been a long time coming for the Panthers. And I think they're... Uh, they may be looking uh, a little bit better than I expected them to this season. We'll see how they finish out. Chicago Bears hosting the New England Patriots. And you can see the Bears were six and a half point favorites. And somebody forgot to tell the Chicago Bears. <laughs> Guys, oh my goodness. Chicago has now lost three games in a row. And the fans are rightly hitting the panic button as it seems to be getting worse week after week. The Bears were four and two heading into their bye week. Yeah. And then now they've rattled off three losses. So I don't know what they did in their bye week, but it wasn't good. As for the Patriots, after losing six in a row, they now have won two of their last three. I talked about Drake May already. I'll talk about Drake May again. He's a good quarterback. You can just see it. You can feel it. He's got the intangibles to be a good, I'm going to say possibly great quarterback in this league. And week by week, how we said, we see the Bears getting worse. I think week by week, we're seeing the Patriots starting to form into something. 
And I'm sorry for both of those feelings of what we've seen over the last few weeks, the one team getting worse. I'm sorry. That's a better team than the Patriots. If you hold up the rosters for both of these teams, I am telling you Chicago bears have a better team than the new England Patriots. And the fact that the new England Patriots went into Chicago and beat them 19 to three. To me, that is a complete statement of the head coaching position in Chicago. Matt Eberflus must go. He's another one I've been calling out for a while saying this guy is not the guy. This is not the head coach that Chicago needs. He's an, he's not a good head coach. I've seen him make some bonehead calls. And there's no way this Bears team was ready. There is no way this Bears team was ready. And when you're not ready to take on the Patriots, again, I'm not trying to diss the Patriots, but let's be honest. Like I said, the Patriots a couple weeks ago admitted, hey, we're a rebuilding team. We're rebuilding right now. Again, somebody forgot to tell the Bears. The Patriots are absolutely showing signs of improvement. The one thing they need to improve is their third down stats on offense, and they need to limit turnovers. That's it. If they clean that up, just that alone, their record would be so much better this season. But at least they have a plan. At least they have something they can circle and say, low-hanging fruit, this is what we need to fix. For the Bears, I don't know what the Bears need at this point. I don't know what they need because the talent is there. But it was not prepared for this game. The Patriots entered the season as the 12th youngest team in the NFL. As they continue to play, you can see the growth. You can see the chemistry starting to form. I feel like seeing this Patriots team go head-to-head with the Bears showed us more about the Bears than the Patriots at this point. And it's not good. You can see my player of the game in this one was the Patriots defense. Nine sacks, 13 tackles for losses, five passes defended, 13 quarterback hits, and they only allowed three points. Caleb Williams was sacked nine times. Nine times. I mean, this is kind of how Caleb Williams looked in the early stages of the season. Then he got looking really good, and somehow we went back to week two now. (laughs) I don't know how that happened. Like I say, since the bye week. Since the bye week, this team has yet to win. They've had three games since their bye week. They are 0-3. Matt Eberflus must go. Numbers that matter in this one. Well, can we just start with third downs? Look at this. The Bears. One for 14 on third down conversions. 2.4 yards per play. 69 passing. I'm Guys, this is so bad. 69 passing yards. 1.8 yards per pass. Nine sacks for a negative 51 yards. Meanwhile, they're giving up 144 rushing yards to the Patriots. Both teams... The Bears barely ever made it in the red zone, but when they did, they failed. And the Patriots made it there five times and only was able to make it successful once. So, again, Patriots lucky they're playing the Bears, but they did enough to win. Drake May did have the one interception, but luckily again, because they're playing the Bears, it didn't matter. Just a bad game for the Bears. And I think a lot of how they come out next week is going to say a lot about this team. And it's going to say a lot about Matt Eberflus. But if you're a Bears fan, I would love to know what you guys think the problem is. Is it Matt Eberflus or am I way off? Is it Caleb Williams? I mean, who carries the burden for what this team's doing? I believe it starts and ends with Matt Eberflus. I do. This team was not ready. How are you not ready against the Patriots? 
Incredible. So, to me, great win for the Patriots. They go to 3-7. and seven. Bears now drop to 4-5. and five. Buffalo Bills heading to Indianapolis to take on the Colts. Buffalo came into this one four and a half point favorites. Yeah, they win. I don't. I don't know if anybody was going to question this one. Uh, they win. Now Josh Allen didn't have his best game, throwing two interceptions, but Buffalo's good enough. They can fight through that stuff. Josh Allen did run for another touchdown. And the Bills' defense forced Joe Flacco into four turnovers. Four turnovers. I know I'm the one that's been calling for Joe Flacco to get the starting position. I don't change my mind on that. Because despite having four turnovers, he kept the Colts in this game. He did. Anthony Richardson would not have. So Joe Flacco is still showing us the fight and the experience. But yeah, you cannot have four turnovers. I don't care if you're Joe Flacco, uh, Caleb Williams, Drake May, hell, Patrick Mahomes. You just cannot have four turnovers. The Bills have now won five games in a row. Buffalo's Taron Arnold took a pick back 23 yards for a touchdown on the very first play ran by the Colts. And it kind of set the tone for the day. The Bills would score 17 points off of those three turnovers. The interceptions, I should say. Josh Allen would also throw multiple interceptions, two. But the Colts were only able to score three points off of those. And that's, that's again, opportunity, what you do with it. First, getting the opportunities is great. But what can you do with it? Colts couldn't get out of their own way. And the defense couldn't bail out their turnovers on offense. Pretty much that flat, that simple, that easy. Despite throwing two picks on their first two drives, the Colts only trailed 20 to 13 at halftime. And that's why I say that was a big, that's Flacco, right? That's Flacco not getting flustered or not giving up. Just keep playing. Let it play out. See what happens. That's what good teams do. That's what good quarterbacks can do. It's rising above. But in the five drives in the second half, the Colts would punt, they would fumble, they would turn it over on downs, they would throw another interception, and they would get a touchdown. Problem is, touchdown came way too late. Meanwhile, the Bills would add three points off of the turnover on downs, and they would add a a touchdown off the third interception, and they had extended their lead at that point. The AFC East leading Bills have topped 30 points in four straight games and have now improved to 8-2 and two for the first time since 1993. And we all know about the 1993 Buffalo Bills. Yep. He has six turnovers in his two starts, does Flacco, since he's uh, replaced Anthony Richardson. He is 1-3 as a starter in Indianapolis. Again, I think that still has more to do with just Indianapolis as a whole than it does Joe Flacco. I don't think Anthony Richardson would have had a better record. And um, I think Joe Flacco still shows me just more. He just gives the Colts an opportunity that I don't believe Anthony Richardson does. He's a true leader. He fights through adversity. He's not asking to come out of the game. You know, so there's a lot of stuff that I still like about Flacco. He was 26 of 35 on the day. Not horrible. 272 yards. That's enough offense. Two touchdowns. That's good. Just get rid of those turnovers. Really. Especially against a team like the Bills. Cannot give them extra opportunities. Numbers that matter in this one. Bills were good on third downs. 7 to 14. Uh, The interceptions, you can see Bills threw two. Colts threw three. Turnovers total, Colts had four, and then points off of turnovers was the biggest stat as the Bills got 17 of their 30 points off of the Colts' turnovers. Big deal. But you can't have them. Denver Broncos heading to the Kansas City Chiefs. We talked about this last week. I said watch out for the Broncos because 
this is a team that absolutely could be poised to knock off the Chiefs. And for a majority of the game, I was right. Unfortunately, when the rubber hit the road and we got to the end, the Chiefs, like all good teams do, found a way to win. The Chiefs blocked Broncos' potential game-winning field goal in the final moments and hold on to win 16-14. to Chiefs were 7.5-point favorites, so they did not cover the spread, but they do get the all-important win to stay undefeated at 9-0. and The Chiefs had taken the lead on Buckner's field goal with just 5.57 to go in the game. Other than that, Denver was really looking like they were going to get the win. But Bo Nix and the Broncos converted a trio of third downs while marching right back down the field after the Chiefs had taken the lead. Thinking, yeah, they're setting Will Lutz up for the winner here. Like, this is going to be a walk-off. And the one chance that the Chiefs had was, well, unless we can get a block, and nobody really felt like that was going to happen until it did. And this is just, there's really nothing you can say about this win other than good teams find ways to win, good teams find ways to close. Chiefs did. Again, you can beat them down for three quarters, three and a half quarters, three and three quarter quarters. It doesn't matter. If you don't play a full four quarters against a team like the Ravens, against a team like the Lions, against a team like the Chiefs, guess what? They're going to find a way to win in the end. The Ravens did it, and now the Chiefs did it. And th that tells you how good these teams are. The Chiefs have now become the fifth Super Bowl champion to win his first nine games the next season. This also matches the best start to a season in franchise history. They're on a 15-game win streak dating back to last season, which is the longest in the NFL since the Packers won 19 back in 2020 or uh, yeah, 2010 to 2011 season. Broncos D was giving Mahomes fits throughout the first half. Like, they looked like they were going to upset the Chiefs. The Broncos were clicking on offense, scoring touchdowns on two very long drives. The first one was uh, to Devon Valet, And then the second one was a 32-yard touchdown to Sutton. And the Broncos were up 14-3 to at that point. But... Like always, Mahomes would just keep fighting, keep playing. He'd get into a rhythm. He'd end up hitting all seven of his targets for 62 yards, but they'd got stopped at the two-yard line, setting up a fourth down. Surprisingly, Andy Reid went for it, <laughs> and Mahomes had, had it pay off. He had it pay off. So, again, we talk about opportunities. The Broncos had opportunities to close this one down. And when the Chiefs went for it on fourth and two, that would have been a major opportunity. But, like always, how many times have we seen it? Mahomes to Kelsey. Will Lutz failed to kick a 60-yard field goal heading into halftime, but the Broncos still did hold the lead 14-10. to However, Kansas City had won its last eight games when trailing the second half. So they were not worried about being down in this game at all. It almost seems like they <laughs> they uh, they wish for it sometimes. So look, teams, good teams know how to close. Good teams know how to finish. That's what the Chiefs did. Kareem Hunt gets my player of the game. 14 carries, 35 yards. Doesn't sound like player of the game, right? Also had seven catches for 65 yards and the reason I gave it to Kareem Hunt is because I don't think he gets enough uh, attention and I think he's been a big part of this offense and yeah his numbers might not sparkle it might not be a fantasy football uh, player's dream but it's important yards it's important first downs he just gets that gritty part for the Chiefs done week in week out so wanted to give Kareem Hunt Props for that. 
Numbers that matter in the game, first downs from penalties. Chiefs got two extra first downs from Broncos penalties. Cannot do that. Cannot give them extra opportunities. Chiefs are also two for two on fourth downs. Both of them that they tried, they got. And then again, the Broncos got themselves six penalties, which again, might not always look like a big deal. Like, oh, just 35 yards. It's not even the yards necessarily a lot of times with penalties. It's the, the, the disruption to drives whether it be on offense or defense. It's either helping out the offense against you or it's slowing your offense down. So either way, when you're getting a penalty, it's just not a good thing. And so for that, yeah, that played into it too, I think. Again, it really comes down to the X's and O's at the end of the day when you're in a tight game like this against a good team like the Chiefs. It's the littlest of things that you can't give them those extra opportunities because in the end, that can make or break a game. And so, good game for the Broncos. I will say that. I think just to go head-to-head -head with the Chiefs like this shows you how good this team can be. Shows you the uh, confidence that Bo Nix has. And uh, so, they, they definitely shouldn't be uh, holding their head low after this game. Yeah, they wanted to get that win. Yeah, they wanted to get that upset. Yeah, they wanted to give Kansas City that first L. But at the end of the day, they're at 500 right now. They're not out of the playoff hunt. And they showed the level they can go to against a team like the Chiefs. Now we go to the NFC South for a division rival here. The Atlanta Falcons going to New Orleans to take on the Saints. Atlanta came in four and a half point favorites. But the Saints had a secret weapon. Darren... Rizzi, that's right, Darren Rizzi, the interim head coach, taking over once Dennis Allen was fired on Monday. So he was making his first start as a head coach for the Saints. Saints entered the game without top receivers Chris Olave dealing with a concussion and Rashid Shahid, who of course is out for the year with a knee injury. And the Saints topped the Falcons 20 to 17 to snap a seven-game losing streak. Alvin Kamara also became the franchise's all-time leading rusher as he ran for 109 yards on the day. Tyron Matthew killed a promising Atlanta drive with an interception of Kirk Cousins at the New Orleans 38 with two minutes to go. The Falcons, who now are 6-4, and four, they missed opportunities to score at least 13 more points than they actually did. Yun Hoku had three failed field goal attempts for the first time in his career. One missed wide, another got blocked, and a third hit the upright. So at least he had variety. <laughs> Derek Carr finished with a season-high 269 yards and two touchdown passes. He also didn't turn the ball over, and that is always the biggest component to both of these quarterbacks, to be honest. Kirk Cousins and De Derek Carr, the first thing you look at when they lose and when they win, what were the turnovers? Because that probably played into either one. Either they didn't have any, and that's why they won, or they had a bunch, and that's why they lost. Uh, but Rizzi came in. And he had a clear message, according to Elvin Kamara. Unity. Unity was one of the words that Elvin Kamara credits Rizzi using to try and get this team turned around. Kind of crazy that that's, that's something that a coach needs to say to get you guys fired up or whatever it was that uh, Elvin Kamara is claiming. But look, whatever it is, it worked. So kudos to Darren Rizzi, kudos to the Saints, and what a big loss for the Falcons. This was absolutely a winnable game for the Falcons. Should have won it, could have won it, didn't. And we expect this AFC South to still be a tight division down the stretch. Are we going to look back on this game and say, woulda, coulda, shoulda? Maybe. But my players in the game for this one, Derek Carr, because what we just talked about, you know, uh, season high in yards, had two touchdowns. 
And then how about Marquez Valdez Scantling? We talked about the loss of Rashid Shahid and Chris Olave coming into this game. They needed somebody to step up. And Marquez Valdez Scantling absolutely stood, stepped up. He had three catches. But of those three catches, they went 109 yards and he had two touchdowns. Big time game for him. So congratulations to the Saints. They moved to three and seven. And if nothing else, they just took a shot at the Falcons and may have altered their season if nothing else. Numbers that matter in this one, again, the Atlanta Falcons had the one turnover. Saints did not turn the ball over. That plays sometimes into it. Uh, rushing yards, Falcons rushed for 181 rushing yards. 181. But I think the biggest stat of all was the fact that Yun Ho Ku could not make a field goal to save his life. One for four on field goals. That right there is 12 point difference. That right there would have made a huge difference in this score. And um, kind of crazy. Yun Ho Ku actually. My kicker on my fantasy team, which I did end up also losing a tight score, and uh, I'm blaming him as well. And I'm probably going to drop Yun Ho Koo, and I know he's a good kicker, can be a good kicker, but it seems like he's starting to struggle a little bit. So too many kickers out there to stick around with him. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunately, I think that's where you look on this game um, is just the fact that he couldn't make the field goals that he was being set up for. That takes us to the 49ers heading to Tampa Bay. Again, this is going to be a big game for both teams. Both teams are trying to stay in the hunt, trying to maybe win their divisions. Neither one of their divisions is really good, so they're both still um, alive and well in those. But uh, 49ers came in a clear favorite, six and a half points favorite, by the way. Christian McCaffrey making his 2024 debut after dealing with his Achilles tendonitis. And uh, yeah, so let's get to it. Jake Moody made up for missing three field goals earlier in the game by kicking a 44-yard game-winning field goal to give the 49ers the win. We just talked about Yun Ho Koo who also went one for four, and it's it's funny. We're blaming Yun Ho Koo for going one for four. We're thanking Jake Moody for going one for four. It's all about when you get that one of four, I guess. But, yeah, look, the 49ers dodged a bullet. We saw this with Atlanta. If you can't make field goals, that can come back and bite you. It almost did the 49ers. Another good story coming out of this one, Ricky Pearsall, who, of course, was shot uh, in the preseason, uh, rookie wide receiver for the 49ers taken in the draft, got his first career touchdown. So that had to be a great feeling for him. And uh, just nice to see when you really think of being shot in the chest and not knowing if you're going to live or die. You know, uh, probably had those moments in his head when he was shot of not knowing if is this it? And then to be able to achieve something like a, a touchdown in the NFL a dream you've had since a little boy. Very cool moment when you really think of it like that. So congratulations to him. Uh, 49ers, look, they jumped out to a 10-0 lead before the Bucks would answer with a field goal of their own to go into halftime 10-3. 49ers then came out in the second half, and they had a muffed punt by Jacob Cowing on their first possession of the second half, and that allowed Tampa Bay to jump right back into the game. They recovered the ball at the 21-yard line, and they ran it four straight times, punched it in with Rashad White. Boom. All of a sudden now, we've got ourselves a 10-10 game. So that quick, mistakes like that, just a muffed punt, can get teams that are good and take advantage of the opportunities they're given to jump right back into games. And so for that, the Buccaneers did. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. They got a turnover. They scored a touchdown off of it. They got in the tied game. It was good. Unfortunately, the 49ers would take the lead right back on their very next drive when they'd kick a field goal. Tampa would benefit in the second half by two missed field goals from Jake Moody. 
But credit the 49ers defense because on those opportunities, Tampa Bay was held to three points. Again, opportunities and result of what you do with it. I'm going to repeat that because that's the name of the game. Can we get more opportunities than them? And can we make more happen out of our opportunities than them? The Buccaneers, though, however, would still continue to fight. They would tie the game late with a field goal following another Jake Moody miss, leaving the Niners just 41 seconds to try and respond. Now, a lot of teams would say, let's send this thing to overtime and, you know, see what happens. 41 seconds was plenty of time for the 49ers. Purdy would go four for four for 39 yards to move the ball to the Niners, uh, for the, move the ball to Tampa Bay's 26-yard line, setting up Jake Moody's 44-yard game winner. Now, earlier in the game, Jake Moody missed a 49-yard field goal, a 50-yard field goal, and a 44-yard field goal, and here he's going for another 44-yard field goal. But like any good player, Rise above, shake it off, get it out of your head, and just make the play. And for the 49ers, he made the play, comes up big. 49ers now move to 5-4. and four. For the Buccaneers, they put up a good fight against a good 49ers team. They had their moments. They had their opportunities. They just couldn't punch in some touchdowns when they needed to. Had to settle for field goals. And they take the loss and drop to four and six. Player of the game in this one, Brock Purdy going 25 of 36, 353 yards, two touchdowns, three sacks. Debo Samuel getting into it with the lawn snapper uh, after all the missed field goals. And uh, yeah, not a good look there. So the 49ers will have to work through that, see if they can prevent their team from falling apart. But just kind of something that was showed up on TV cameras. Of course, everybody's answer to that was, well, it's, it's going to happen all the time. High emotions. I get it. But we've heard that. But then we've also seen other things where it leaks out and it becomes a bigger issue. So just continue to monitor that. And I would imagine if the 49ers start winning again, nobody will ever think about it again. If the 49ers start losing, it could rear its ugly head. That's all I'm saying. Numbers that matter in this one. Again, 49ers, 338 passing yards. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers had just 105. They were averaging 8.7 yards per pass. Uh, they did have the one turnover, but again, the the Buccaneers, you know, they, they took advantage of it, but they needed more help than just that one. And then field goals, Jake Moody, three for six on the day overall. So he, I guess he wasn't one for four. He actually was three for six. But uh, yes, uh, did kick one field goal enough to get the win. Uh, as for the Buccaneers, they were two for two on field goals, but they needed one more to get the win. They did not. And yes, the 49ers, are they back on track now they got McCaffrey back? Maybe. They're going to be interesting to watch because it's big to get Christian McCaffrey back. He didn't have a huge day in this game. But just to have him back and have him be a threat for the defense to think about and to have to worry about, I think that does improve the 49ers offense. And uh, I would expect to see them maybe go on a little bit of a run now with him back. But if not, then, yeah, we'll see. See how this all plays out. But really, right now at this point, being 5-4, and four, the NFC West is absolutely in their grasp. If they want it, the question is, can they hold on to it? Pittsburgh Steelers, Washington Commanders. This was a game I was looking forward to. Uh, two teams that I really have a lot of respect for this season. I think both teams are really playing well. And uh, maybe the Steelers a little bit more surprising than the Commanders. I think the Commanders are surprising too. But I think you could tell right off the bat that Jaden Daniels was going to be a star in this league from week one. And then it was just building on that ever since. But, uh, yeah, both teams coming in really good. And Russell Wilson, of course, still holding on to the starting quarterback position. Pittsburgh would be the first to score as they would cap a 70-yard drive with a 16-yard touchdown pass to George Pickens. 
but Pittsburgh would get careless, and I could not believe that I was seeing this. They went for it on a fourth and 15 from their own 16-yard line when they would attempt a fake punt that was an incomplete pass. Uh, unbelievable. I could... Steelers are one of the most conservative, just, hey, let's just play it straight up, how it goes. You never have to worry about that stupid shit with them. And for some reason, they went for it, and they didn't get it. And very early on, and luckily for them, it was very early on, the commanders took full advantage and, yeah, scored a touchdown, tied the game, and had me scratching my head like, what the hell did I just watch? Like, I could not believe the Steelers did that. That's just not their kind of football. Uh, but on the day, Russell Wilson threw 50% accuracy, but did hit three passes for 92 yards on the day. Uh, so he was hitting the deep ball, which a lot of people are now comparing him to back when he was with the Seahawks and how he could hit the deep ball back then. Kind of starting to see shades of that here with Pittsburgh. Um, he had another 11 completions that went for 103 yards. So on the day, 13.9 yards per uh, completion, which is great. I mean, that's a first down every time at that point. But yeah, the fact that he can stretch the field now, that's big. Looks like he's starting to get comfortable with his receivers. George Pickens had five catches for 91 yards. So it looks like those two are really starting to get some chemistry. And uh, that's a big deal for the Steelers. The Steelers team is good. They're very, very good. And this is a great matchup for them to test and see just how good they are. Jaden Daniels on the day also threw for 50%. He was averaging 11.8 yards per completion. So again, another good day for him. Another good day for the Commanders. Um, this came, game came down to the Steelers' defense, basically bailing out two late turnovers by the Steelers. Najee Harris had a fumble, and uh, Russell Wilson threw an interception. And the Steelers' defense, in those moments, held tight and was able to get the win. So kudos to the Pittsburgh Steelers' defense in this one. The Commanders were unable to capitalize on either one of those turnovers. And on the final play of the game, Zach Ertz, on a fourth down, came up inches short of a first down. And that's what ended it because it gave the Steelers a, the ball back. They were able to run the clock out. And sneak away with this win. Commanders came in a one and a half point favorite. So we knew this was going to be a close game. And this did not disappoint. I think both teams played well. Again, Steelers defense came up big when they had to. And for the Commanders, they just couldn't take advantage of the two opportunities they had late in the game to get points off of it. Steelers now go to seven and two. Commanders are seven and three. And for the numbers that matter... Steelers, one for two on fourth downs. They did have the interception. 140 yards on the ground. That's old school Steelers football right there. Just pound, pound the ball and have success. 43 rushing attempts in this game. 43 to 29 passing attempts. So you can see they're a run first offense, but then they can take the top off of the defense and hit you deep as Russell Wilson is starting to show. So every week now, this team's getting more dangerous, more high-powered. They're going to be uh, dangerous. Good defense, good running, potential to hit you deep down the field. Hard to defend. For the commanders, I think they showed they, believe they belong in the playoff talk. They just played a really good Steelers defense, or really good Steelers team right to the wire. Had opportunities. So they're going to grow from this. And uh, yeah, I, I like this matchup. This was a great matchup, and it did not disappoint at all. Minnesota Vikings, Jacksonville Jaguars. Mac Jones got the start for Jacksonville. But it was the Minnesota defense that was the main contributor to the result of this game. Minnesota came in seven and a half point favorites over the Jaguars. They did not cover the spread. They do get the win, but I'm telling you right now, a lot of Vikings fans had to be really have a hard time breathing in this game because 
they should have ran over the Jaguars, and they did not. They did not. Jacksonville was held to just 143 yards of offense. Again, that goes back to thank you, Vikings defense, (laughs) for doing your job. But the Jacksonville offense had opportunities. Sam Darnold threw three interceptions in this game. But luckily for the Vikings, the anemic offense of the Jaguars could not take advantage. The score remained close as Jacksonville led at halftime 7-3. Minnesota would kick three straight field goals in the second half, grab the lead of 12-7, hold on for the win. Jacksonville would suffer three turnovers on their final three drives. Again, good teams know how to finish. Bad teams don't. Final three drives to try and go get a touchdown, try and make something happen, and you have three turnovers? A fumble by Mac Jones and two interceptions. Unbelievable. Bad teams going to do bad things. And the Jacksonville Jaguars, yeah, they're a bad team. Minnesota got lucky with their defense uh, as they were able to reject those opportunities and give the Vikings the win. Next week, Vikings will play the Tennessee Titans and the Jaguars will be taking on The Detroit Lions. Wow. Crazy, crazy times here for for Jacksonville. I mean, look, they had an opportunity, though. This is on Jacksonville, not able to put anything together offensively. You were hand-wrapped. Three opportunities to come back into this game. And you couldn't do enough with any of it to, to make it count. And then to piss away your last three opportunities of the on offense by having turnovers, that's just sloppy play. That's just bad play. So player of the game in this one, I actually gave to John Parker Romo. Make his NFL debut with the Vikings, and he came up huge. They needed the field goals, and he went four for four. Longest one being 45 yards, gets the win. Numbers that matter in this one, Vikings, three penalties by the Jaguars, gave them first downs. Fourth down, they were one for one. 402 total yards of offense, 169 yards rushing, but they were 0 for 5 in the red zone. If the Vikings would have played Anybody else and been 0 for 5 in the red zone and had three turnovers, I would think they lost. They played the one team that they could get away with those kind of stats and still get a win. And then if you look at the clock control in this one, Minnesota had the ball for 42 minutes. Jacksonville had the ball for 17 minutes. So they did not have a lot of time with the ball. And then when they did, they just did not know what to do with it. So Minnesota dodges the bullet, moved to seven and two. Jacksonville remains Jacksonville, dropped to two and eight. Tennessee Titans, Los Angeles Chargers. Chargers came into this one, eight and a half point favorites. And yeah, they covered a spread. They get the win. And uh, look, Tennessee, last week they snuck out a win for the first time since uh, week four. But the Titans brought back Will Levis this week, put him in as starting quarterback, and they go back to their losing ways. He actually had a decent day, though. He did. 18 of 23, 175 yards, two touchdowns, and a quarterback rating of 127.4. So as much as I do joke around about Will Levis, he actually had a good day. It wasn't on him that this game didn't go their way. Uh, The Titans came in with the NFL's top-ranked defense overall. And against the pass. But forced Los Angeles to go three and out only twice in nine possessions. Chargers were humming. They they were in a rhythm. Herbert completed 14 of 18 passes for 164 yards and had 32 rushing yards. He's the seventh quarterback since the NFL-AFL merger and the first since Phillip Rivers in 2018 
to have a passer rating of at least 90 in each of his first nine games of the season. So, yeah, Justin Herbert, sneaky season, having a good one, though. The game turned with 21 seconds remaining in the first half. The Titans appeared to tie it at 13 when Roger McCreary ran back Justin Herbert's fumble 20 yards for a touchdown. But the officials would have a replay. They would review it. And it was ruled an incomplete pass because the officials determined that Herbert's arm was, of course, moving forward. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, a big, big part of this. Tennessee had a nice second half, but it's all about how you finish. And the Titans would have a 62-yard drive, but would have to settle for a field goal. And you just, if you're going to have that much effort, that much time off the clock in a game like this, you got to get the seven. Where the Chargers, they would end drives of 43 yards and 95 yards, both of them with touchdowns. Again, it's how you finish. You can have a really nice drive going, but if at the end of that drive you have to settle for a field goal, usually that's going to come back and bite you. And for the Titans in this one, it did. The 95-yard drive that the Chargers had, they dominated the Titans' defense. It went 11 plays, and they never had a third down on those 11 plays. They just kept picking up first downs all the way down the field. It took seven minutes, seven and a half minutes off the clock, and it gave the Chargers a 17-point lead when it was done. You want to look at one drive and say, what was the game changer? What was the seal of the win? To me, it was that one. Because after that drive, they were up 17, and the Titans only had three minutes left to do any kind of a comeback with. So that was really a just a gut punch of a drive by a good Chargers team. Chargers are now improved to 6-3. and three. Titans fall to 2-7. and seven. One team is still in the playoff hunt, and one is not. Numbers that matter... Four first downs from penalties for the Chargers. Cannot do that if you're the Titans. They were one for one on fourth downs. They were averaging 9.1 yards per pass, and they were three for five in the red zone. The numbers that hurt the Titans, seven sacks on the day and nine penalties. That is not going to work when you are already not a good team (laughs) and you're playing a better team. You can't have seven sacks and nine penalties. It's never going to work out in your favor. Eagles taking on the Dallas Cowboys. Hmm. Eagles came in seven and a half point favorites. Do you remember when the Cowboys and the Eagles used to be a good matchup? Man. The last time the Cowboys had a 28 point loss to the Eagles was back on November 19th, 2017. That loss also was at home for the Cowboys. And they lost 37 to 9 in that one. Dallas finished that season 9 and 7. I don't think we're going to see this Cowboys team finish 9 and 7. That year the Eagles finished 13 and 3. We might see that. I don't know. I don't know if they'll finish with that good of a record, but they'll definitely be closer to that record than I think the Cowboys will be to the 9 and 7. This game saw Dallas lose four fumbles to the Eagles. And were held to just 49 yards passing and 97 yards on the ground. Dallas has too many issues to name and it goes much larger than just the injuries that they want to talk about. Jalen Hurts turned in another nice game. Kudos. For sure. He was 14-20, 202 yards, two touchdowns. He did have an interception. And of course he had the seven carries, 56 yards and two touchdowns. For Cooper Rush... And Trey Lance, they both got some play time. Cooper had more of a chance, and he lost two fumbles. Trey Lance came in, went four for six, 21 yards, but he threw an interception and was sacked twice. It was just ugly. It didn't matter who it was. A.J. Brown also turned in a nice day. Five catches, 109 yards. Dallas gave up four first downs thanks to penalties. They were three for 14 on third downs and had five total turnovers. 
And the one thing Jerry Jones came out of this game complaining about was the sun. Now, let's be fair. The sun absolutely did seem to get into C.D. Lamb's eyes on one of the plays. Jerry, that was one of the plays. You've got a whole lot more issues than the sunshine coming through. Man, this was a bad game. Look, it appeared the sun was an issue. They'll have to fix it, figure that out, put curtains up, whatever they want to do. But for Jerry Jones to come out of this game and that be kind of like his number one gripe, it just seems so detached to me. Like if I'm a Cowboys fan and we have to live through this whole damn game and the first thing your owner talks about is the sun, ah, that's got to be tough. That's got to be tough. So I don't know. I think they got to make a coaching change here as well. I think it's been long enough. This team's been an underachiever year after year. We always have to hear about the Cowboys like they're something special. They're not. And and this just proved it. So Eagles will host the Commanders next Thursday or this coming Thursday. That's going to be a hell of a game there. I think the Commanders could beat the Eagles. But I'll give the Eagles credit. They've been playing pretty good ball lately. But we'll see when they play a very, very tough Commanders team. Commanders, we just saw go to war with the Steelers and almost beat them. So, that's going to be good. It will be in Philly, so maybe home advantage plays a factor. And then for the Cowboys, they will remain at home. Not that it matters. I don't think they have a home field advantage at this point. And they will be playing Monday night against the Houston Texans, who Houston definitely, well, they'll have a bad taste in their mouth. Let's just say that. We'll get to that in here in a bit. But, yes, Texans, Cowboys, Cowboys, man. It was ugly, guys. It was ugly. Eagles defense gets my player of the game in this one. They had three sacks, five tackles for losses, seven passes defended, six quarterback hits, an interception, and, yes, the four fumble recoveries. Numbers that matter in this one, four first downs from penalties, for the Eagles, 348 total yards to 146. Uh, 5.4 yards per play. Cowboys are just 2.6. 49 passing yards for the Cowboys. I cannot say that enough. 49 passing yards all day. Averaged 1.5 yards per completion. Rushing on the day, the Eagles 187. Yeah, 187 is right because they murdered the Cowboys. 187 running the ball. Red zone, Eagles were 4 for 5. Cowboys were 0 for 2. And then turnovers, Cowboys had 5 total turnovers. Mm. Let's talk about the Jets and the Cardinals. Again, talk about an... Un a very uh, overhyped team, I think, coming into the season. New York Jets came into this game, and I found this laughable anyways, but they came into this game on the road one-and-a-half-point favorites. I don't know who's smoking, but they need to set it down because for the Jets even to come into this game as a favorite was a joke. Uh, and, yeah, surprise, they didn't cover the spread and they didn't get the win. And it wasn't even close. One of the biggest disappointments of the 2024 season has to be the Jets. Has to be. With the return of Aaron Rodgers this season, a lot of people were like, hey, they're going to the postseason for sure. And once again, the Jets are the J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. They just, they always underperform. Nothing works out for this team. They are the absolute most bad luck teams I think I can think of. Like, no matter who they sign in the offseason, no matter what happens to the teams around them, they still find a way to just be the Jets. Kyler Murray and the Cardinals embarrass the Jets in a 31-6, no other way to put it, beatdown. The Cardinals have now won four in a row. The Jets have lost six of their last seven. Cardinals came out fast, scoring touchdowns on four of their first five drives in this game. Now, the one thing I liked about the Jets coming into this season was their defense. <laughs> Count me as wrong. E me on that one. I must have been wrong because they looked absolutely atrocious in this one. 
coming off a win against the Texans last week, we thought we might see the Jets turn the corner. But the head coach, Jeff Ulbrich, who is an interim head coach, and I think I don't think we're going to see him get hired in as a head coach. This was his quote. They were not prepared to play. We didn't execute even close to our standard. That falls on my shoulders 100%. I didn't do a good enough job getting these guys ready. Okay, question, question, Jeff. Are you sure that you didn't execute close to your standard? I think that might be your standard. But the fact that he's trying to stand up and say, okay, that's on me. We weren't ready. We weren't prepared. Dude, you're an interim head coach. You can't take a week off. You're supposed to be fighting to become the permanent head coach. And you're going to come out here and say, your guys weren't ready. You didn't do enough to get ready. That's unacceptable. Whether whether you're just trying to be the good guy and take the bullets and take it off your team, whatever it is, it's not good. It's not good. You could have said a million different things other than that. That right there, that answer to me, I think that's a lazy answer. That's a canned answer. So, yeah, no, Jeff Ulbrich got the opportunity of a lifetime. Take over a team with Aaron Rodgers in New York in a, at, the, at the time that was still potentially had the opportunity to be in a playoff hunt, and you've done this with them? It's not good. Arizona was up 24 to 6 at halftime, and the total yards in the first half Arizona had 239 total yards at halftime. The Jets had 85. There's no other way to say it. It was a beatdown. Cardinals get the win. And they improve now to 6-4. and four. They're legitimate. And that's why I say the 49ers might come back and be good to go. But there's some other teams now shooting for that uh, NFC West. The Rams and the Cardinals are not out of that race yet. The Jets' second half stats, because, you know, the first half was so bad. <laughs> their, second, their second half stats, zero points. They ran 31 plays for 133 yards. They had a fumble, a punt, and a turnover on downs. But Jeff Ulbrich didn't have them ready, so that's why. Okay. Numbers that matter in this one, you can see the Cardinals, 406 total yards, 7.1 yards per play, 10.4 yards per pass, 147 yards rushing, and they were 4 for 5 in the red zone. Yeah, Jets were 0 for 3 in the red zone and had turnover. Was not close. Good job for the Cardinals, and a good job for Kyler Murray, who, again, has another amazing day. Really looks like he's in his groove. And when he's in his groove, he's one of the best. And he makes the Cardinals one of the best. So I think this NFC West is really going to come down to the wire. And I think it's going to be a fun, fun division to watch. And don't forget about the Seahawks. Even though they might not be vying to win the division, they might have a lot of what goes on in that division because they're going to be tough to beat uh, as these teams go down the stretch fighting for that spot. And now we go to the craziest game of the week. The Detroit Lions heading to Houston. Detroit Lions came in four and a half point favorites. They did not cover the spread and they damn near did not get the win. <laughs> with the Texans missing Stefan Diggs, who's out for the season with the ACL tear. And Nico Collins, who is out right now with a hamstring injury. The Texans were going to need to find other options to try and match the Lions' firepower. Texans would have Tank Dell, John Meachy, Xavier Hutchinson, and Robert Woods. Look, the Lions would come out of in this one completely out of sync, and the Texans' defense seemed very prepared. Jeff Ulbrich clearly did not work with the Texans because the Texans were prepared. They knew everything the Lions were going to try. They literally were stopping us in the backfield, knocking down passes. I mean, it was it was impressive. The Houston Texans defense came out very impressive. Definitely had a game plan that was working. Jared Goff also looked absolutely horrible with his accuracy in this game. From the very first pass he threw. 
the very first pass he threw, it looked like he threw it right into the ground. And my wife and I are like, what the hell just happened? Like, what was that? And the announcers tried to make it sound like, well, there was nothing to throw to, so he just threw it away. I disagree. I think that was just an ugly pass. Because, one, he could, had an opportunity where he could have pulled it down and ran for a couple yards. Or, two, if you're going to throw it away, you're just going to chuck it into the stands. You're not going to keep it in the play, in the play on the field. So I think that was just an ugly play, and it was just a, a sign of things to come from Jared Goff. Goff threw three first-half interceptions, which would end up leading to 10 Texan points. Houston, on the other hand, scored on five of their six first-half drives. Two touchdowns, three field goals. Texans were up 23-7 to at halftime. The Lions had a total of 109 yards, and 70 of those came on one drive. The other six drives, they totaled just 39 yards of offense. Second half would see more turnovers from Goff. He had two more interceptions, but kudos, major kudos, to the Lions' defense as they would step up and shut down the Texans as they would end up scoring zero points in the second half and had 82 yards of offense on six drives, ending with four punts, an interception, and a missed field goal. Speaking of field goals, the Lions would get huge kicks from their kicker, Jake Bates, as he would tie the game, kicking a 58-yard field goal. Texans would have plenty of time after he he tied it up. They would move back down the field to put themselves in a game-winning situation as they would also line up for a 58-yard field goal with a minute 58 left to go. Fairbairn, who's a great kicker, has kicked many 50-plus-yard field goals, would miss the field goal, and it was not even close. Not only did this keep the score tied, but it gave the Lions great field position and almost two minutes to work with. Lions would take over at their 48-yard line, With a minute 51 to go, they were able to move the ball to the Houston 34-yard line thanks to a big third-down conversion when Goff would hit St. Brown for an 11-yard pass. That was a big play. Had they not had that play, we wouldn't have been kicking a field goal on that drive. But we did. We got the first down. We played it pretty safe, pretty conservative. And then that would set up Jake Bates for a 52-yard field goal, which I thought we had a couple more opportunities we could have tried to make it a little bit closer for Jake Bates. But Dan Campbell had all the confidence in the world, and uh, Jake Bates snuck it in and uh, won the game with a 52-yard field goal, keeping Jake Bates at 100% on field goals this season. Very underrated kicker in the NFL. Everybody talks about his story and how he came up and he came from the UFL or whatever. Look, this guy's a solid kicker. He's kicking big time kicks. 53 and 58, one to tie the game and one to win it. I mean, you talk about high pressure intensity kicks. And he snuck them both in. But you know what? He snuck them in. So the Lions, who just got destroyed in the first half. Just like the Ravens, just like the Chiefs, had to come back in the end and find a way to win. And what do I say about the good teams? They do. They find a way to win. They know how to close. The Lions did it. But major props to the Lions' defense and major props to the Lions' special teams. So for the players of the game on this one, I gave it to Carlton Davis at third, who had four tackles, two passes defended, and two interceptions were huge. And Jake Bates for the two for two on the field goals, 53-58, game winner. Lions now improve to eight and one. Texans fall to six and four. Numbers that matter in this one, Lions 5.6 5.6 yards per play, 8 yards per pass, 5 interceptions to fight through, 
Texans were sacked four times. Lions were not sacked at all. So that was one positive thing that I can say, too, about the offensive side of the ball is that they actually did keep Jared Goff clean. But his inaccuracy was, I don't know what was going on. I really don't. Just one of those nights, I guess. Lions did rush for over 100 yards, but just over 100. So I thought Houston actually did a pretty good job, especially in the first half. They were completely shutting that run game down. It was later in the game where the Lions started to wear down the Texans that we really saw the runs start to happen. Um, and then uh, two for two on field goals versus three and four. Again, had Texans kicked four for four, well, then we might be talking about a different outcome in this game. I think the Lions still would have had an opportunity to come down and tie it and then maybe take it to overtime or who knows. But, but yeah, it was uh, really came down to those field goals at the end that one made it and one didn't. That really divided this game. But uh, the Lions, just to shut down the Texans in the second half after the first half they had, great adjustments at halftime. Kudos to the coaching staff, to the players, everybody, to come out and find a way to get a win out of this one. All right, that takes us now to Monday night football. The Dolphins entered Monday night with a record of 2-6 and six, and among one of the worst in the AFC standings. But on Monday night, the team visited the LA Rams in a matchup of two teams that definitely feel the current situations do not represent their true abilities. Both teams hampered by injuries this season, key injuries. On Monday, the Dolphins showed timely plays and great defense as they held the Rams to just five field goals and no touchdowns. They also were able to get two turnovers and a big-time catch from Tyreek Hill, who has been unusually quiet as of late. He actually caught a touchdown on Monday. That was his first touchdown since week one. The return of Tua definitely seems to have sparked this team, and despite all the trials and tribulations, they're still only a game and a half out of the playoff picture. And the remaining schedule, it looks pretty favorable. They host the Raiders. Then they host the Patriots. They go to Green Bay. Then they host the Jets. They go to the Texans. They host the 49ers. They go to the Browns. And then they go to the Jets to wrap up the season. With the way this team played defensively on Monday, they're not out of any of those games. If they can bring that defense, and if this offense gets rolling at all, and I see signs of it actually starting to happen, this team still stands a chance. Now, are they going to catch the Buffalo Bills in the AFC East? I doubt it, but can they get into the playoffs? I think they absolutely can. I don't think their season is done yet, and it's crazy to say that with them sitting now after the win, three and six, but when you look at that schedule, there's a lot of potential wins in that schedule. So the opportunity's there. The players are pumped up, and uh, look, Jason Sanders Came up big for the Dolphins. He's the player of the game from my standpoint. Three for three on field goals. He kicked two 50-yarders and then a 37-yard field goal. But that was a separation this team needed to get the win. Like I say, Ty Tariq Hill had like three catches for 16 yards, but one of them went for a big-time touchdown. That was nice to see. Jalen Waddell... Three catches, 57 yards. I mean, this team didn't even play their best offense. And they found a way to win because the defense was so strong. And for the defense to have such a big game, to shut down the Rams from being able to get into the end zone, to force five field goals, that tells you a lot about what this defense is capable of doing. The Rams are not a bad offense at all. Like, the Rams lately have really been playing well. They've gotten healthy. They've shown really good signs of their offense clicking. And they just ran into a Dolphins defense that was ready to perform on Monday. Matthew Stafford threw for 293 yards. It's not like they shut him down. 
they just shut him down when they needed to. They didn't let him get in the end zone. So if you go to the numbers that matter, you can see the Rams were 0 for 3 in the red zone. 0 for 3. Meanwhile, the Dolphins were 2 for 3. Dolphins were also good on third down, picking up 6 of 13. Again, Tua didn't have monster numbers, just over 200 yards passing. But there were clutch plays. There were a lot of just big-time clutch plays in this game, both sides. Offense, defense, and special teams. Tua was 20 of 28, so very accurate. They only got hit with one penalty, so they played clean ball. They did have two turnovers. But at the end of the day, they found a way to win because out of the two turnovers, Rams only were able to score three points off of it. Same for the uh, the Dolphins, actually, too. The Rams also had two turnovers, and the Dolphins were only able to score three points off of that. So both defenses did a pretty good job of protecting the uh, mistakes by the offenses. But it's those little things in this game that came out to be the difference. Six penalties by the Rams. 0 for 3 in the red zone. You know, so it was just the little things that made the difference. And for the Rams, like I said, they kicked field, five field goals. Five field goals. They actually kicked six. They made five of them. But the Dolphins did enough to find the win. And I'm telling you, when you look at the remaining schedule of the Dolphins team, they're not dead yet. This is a team to watch. Breaking news. According to Adam Schefter, change in Chicago. Shane Waldron is out as the Bears offensive coordinator per sources. Shane Waldron is the second offensive coordinator to be, be fired this year. Luke Getze was fired by the Raiders on November 3rd. Getze was with the Bears last season, and he was fired as well. So you've got Shane Waldron and Luke Getze, the two offensive coordinators that were fired so far this year, both with recent ties to the Bears. You got to look at that as an indictment of Matt Eberflus. And I think Matt Eberflus is on a super hot seat right now. This was a move to make to try and save his own job, in my opinion. And I don't think it's going to work. I think Matt Eberflus will not be the Bears coach next season. I don't know if that means he gets let go during this season still or if he'll be uh, let go during the offseason. But I do not see Matt Eberflus with the Bears in 2025, no matter how it works out. But when you look at it, you can see the reason for the change. Chicago hasn't scored a touchdown on their last 23 drives. And the remaining strength of schedule is one of the toughest in the NFL with a combined winning percentage of over 700. So it's not going to get better. I think the Bears are going to continue to struggle. And just what a weird, wacky season this has been for the Bears. But we knew something had to change. And, well, here's the first sign. Shane Waldron is gone. So let's take a look at the updated standings. AFC on the left. NFC on the right. You can see the Chiefs still at the top of the AFC with a record of 9-0. and the Bills and Steelers follow along. And then it's the Ravens and Chargers that split up between the Texans, who also lead their division. But if you go down, you see the Dolphins at three and six. Seven teams go to the playoffs for each conference. If you go seven teams down, it's the Colts. The Colts are four and six. The Dolphins are three and six. So that's why I say it is far from over for the Dolphins, for the Bengals. I mean, these are two good teams sitting on the outside looking in. 
And the Dolphins, we know why they are three and six. The injury to Tua absolutely hurt this team. Not to mention Tyreek Hill has not been super healthy either. As this team gets healthy, as this team gets their chemistry going again, they are dangerous. So I would look for the Dolphins and the Bengals to still make a run at this thing for sure. What teams, though, do they move out? I mean, the Broncos are still questionable. They're young. I like the Broncos. I, I think they still have a great shot at this. But what I would like to know is what's the remaining schedules look like for all these teams? Because I know the Dolphins because I looked them up. And it's very favorable for them. In the NFC, we see the Lions at the top of the NFC, 8-1. and one. Vikings, 7-2. and two. Eagles, 7-2. and two. Commanders, 7-3. and three. And then you got the Packers at 6-3. and three. And then you drop down there, and Falcons and Cardinals, even though they're leading their divisions, with records of 6-4. and four. And I'm telling you that NFC West is going to be very intriguing down the stretch. Cardinals six and four, 49ers five and four, Rams four and five. I mean, Seattle four and five as well, but I do not feel like Seattle is on the same level as those other three. I feel like it's going to be between those three. But the way the Cardinals are playing right now, they're playing their best ball. So it's going to be up to the 49ers, I think, to try and keep pace. And the loss by the Rams on Monday, that's a big loss. Like every loss now between these three teams is, is going to be impactful because they're all trying to fight for that spot. Now, if we go seven teams down in the NFC, two, four, six, it's the Cardinals. So here's your wild card right here. <laughs> here's your wild card. So they're all going to be trying to jump each other here. But I don't like a lot of these teams in the NFC in the wild card as much as I can pick out a couple teams here in the AFC. And I think it's only a couple. I think a lot of the guy the a lot of the teams that are in the playoffs right now as we sit here are going to remain in the playoffs. And it's still fairly early in the season to say that but the way that we see the difference the divide between the the level of play of these teams i think it's safe to say speaking of level of teams let's take a look at the power rankings you can see detroit has held on to the number one spot the top four actually stayed the same with detroit uh kansas city buffalo and baltimore However, Philadelphia has moved themselves up into the number five spot, which is actually where their preseason pre ranking had them. So with moving two spots up, some teams moved down. Um, and you can see Houston moved down. Atlanta Falcons moved down. Washington moved down three spots. So there is some big movement. Uh, as far as the top 10 goes now. If you go all the way down to the bottom, you can see Jacksonville now sits at the number 32 spot. They dropped four spots last week. They were at 28. They now sit at 32. Carolina, who sat at 32 for a long time, finally moved out of the basement. I want to say last week was their first time out of the, the basement. They now sit at number 28. So they're making a little noise there. And then let's go to Miami because Miami, I, you know, how my feelings about them right now with how they just came out of that game on Monday, they actually moved up four spots as well. They are technically right now in the top 20. Technically in the top 20. Teams that are just sitting outside the top 10 that might surprise you, the Texans, the 49ers, uh, Arizona, and who was the other one? Denver, Tampa Bay. I mean, these are all quality teams, but they are sitting right now outside the top 10. And, and look at Dallas. Look at Dallas. 14 spots off 
of where they were projected in the preseason. Same as the Cleveland Browns. Jacksonville's 15 spots off. The surprise stories. Commanders are 18 spots better than they were projected. And the Cardinals are 16 spots better than projected. All right, that was week 10. Let's get into week 11. What do we have ahead of us? And man, we've got some good matchups for sure. Thursday night's going to kick us off with a great matchup. The Washington Commanders heading to Philadelphia to take on the Eagles. Eagles will enter the game a three and a half game favorite, unless there's an adjustment. As of right now, I should say. As of right now, they sit a three and a half point favorite. Look, this is going to be a good game. A couple weeks ago, I would have said Commanders win this one easy. Because the Eagles really kind of were looking like they were in a in a really distressed situation with that team between the coach, you know, getting into it with the fans and just rumblings on the sidelines. I just it wasn't a good look. Somehow, some way, the Eagles have pulled themselves out of that. I think a lot of it has to do with just competition they've been against. But this is going to be a great test for both sides. Both of these teams looking to make a statement. Both of these teams looking to be at the top of the NFC East. Commanders have been there a few weeks. Eagles just bumped them out this week. So the Commanders will be fighting for that number one spot in this matchup. I think Commanders find a way to win because like I say, I think what we're seeing from the Eagles may be a little bit more of their competition that they've been playing where the Commanders we've seen in some really tight matchups some really hard-fought opponents, and they've been up for the challenge. So I think they're battle-tested, and I think they're going to, to come out on Thursday night and perform very, very well. Um, I think their defense is very underrated, and so we'll see. But for me, I'm taking the commanders in this one. Then we go to the Sunday games. And we start with uh, Packers at the Chicago Bears. Packers, six and a half point favorites. Look, the Bears couldn't have lurk, looked worse against the Patriots this week. Unfortunately for them, I think the struggle is real. I don't see them bouncing back. Packers, I look, six and a half, I don't think it's that much. And, and look, the Bears, I really thought, had a great defense. They've even looked suspect as of late. So give me the Packers and give me the six and a half. Next, Jaguars at the Lions. Lions are a 13-point favorite over the Jaguars. We'll do a full breakdown here in a little bit of this these two teams. I'm taking the Lions and I'm taking the 13 points. Vikings at Titans. Vikings favored by six. Yes, yes. Raiders at Dolphins. Dolphins favored by seven and a half. I'm actually taking that one too. I think the Raiders are a mess. Dolphins, I think they're right on the brink of breaking out. They they looked impressive without putting up impressive stats, if that makes sense. Like, I know Tua can put up a whole lot more. I know Tyreek Hill can put up a lot more. I know Achan can run for a whole lot more. So we didn't even see the best version of the Dolphins, and they knocked out a good team through defense, through special teams. What does that tell me? That tells me this team's ready to break out. They put it all together. They get the offense clicking too. Yeah, they're going to put up some big points. So yes, Dolphins, I'm taking seven and a half. Rams, five over the Patriots. I'm having some hesitation on this one. I got to be honest, a little bit because of what the Dolphins did to the Rams have me a little concerned about maybe what the Rams are doing right now, but more so from a positive standpoint of what I see the Patriots doing right now. This Patriots team is growing every week. We're seeing it. And the fact they're going to be home, Rams are coming off a loss. You don't know if that's a trend that we're going to see for a little bit with the Rams. I'm kind of scared to take the Rams with with five points. I'm almost scared to take the Rams just straight up. Let's be honest. So you know what? Let's let's make this my first upset of the week. 
We'll go with Patriots on this one. Drops us down to the Browns at the Saints. Saints are a one-point favorite. Sure, give it to me. I think the Browns are a mess. Uh, Saints got to win. It's only a one-point spread, and they're at home. So, yeah, I'll take the Saints. Colts at Jets. Jets are a three-and-a-half-point favorite. Nope, give me the Colts all day straight up. Ravens, three-and-a-half-point favorite over the Steelers in Pittsburgh. This is the matchup I want to see. This is going to be a great game. I like both of these teams. Ravens at times have not looked their best. And it's usually through their defense that really struggles. We saw the Steelers starting to take the top off the defenses a little bit. They've got a great run game and a great defense. I'm going for another upset here. Give me the Steelers at home to knock off the Ravens. Sunday, 4 o'clock games. Falcons at Broncos. Broncos are a two-point favorite. I don't know what happened to the Falcons this past week, but they're picked a heck of a time now because they've got a really good Broncos team that they need to go visit. Give me the Broncos, and they'll cover the two. Seahawks at 49ers. 49ers, six-and-a-half-point favorites. Yes and yes. And then finally, the Chiefs at the Bills. Bills are a two-and-a-half-point favorite over the undefeated Kansas City Chiefs. This is a great matchup. This is to say who's the best team in the AFC right now. By record, it's the Chiefs. But many people believe the Bills and Ravens have a lot to say about that. Well, the Bills are going to have their opportunity to say it right to the Chiefs' face in Buffalo. Gimme Buffalo. Two and a half points. Sure. I'll take that too. I just think Josh Allen in a in a in a matchup like this, he finds ways to win late. The Chiefs have a good defense, but I think the Bills defense can stop the Chiefs offense better than vice versa. I think the Bills will find a way to pull this one out, especially at home. If this was in Kansas City, I probably would take the complete opposite approach on this one. But I think in a matchup like this, home field advantage can give you a, a little bit of that extra. And we'll see what the weather's like. I mean, it's still mid-November, so it shouldn't be too bad, but you just never know in Buffalo. And that could play into it as well. But the Chiefs have had a lot of tight games this season that they've actually won. But I think if they play that, that uh, strategy against the Bills and they get in a tight matchup again, I think the Bills will catch them. So we'll see. It's going to be a great matchup either way, though. Sunday night, it's the Cincinnati Bengals taking on the Los Angeles Chargers. The Bengals have been one of the most hot and cold teams all season. Really hard to get a, a gauge on where they're at this season and who they are. Chargers have actually been, I think, very underrated, kind of just going under the radar and having success. Chargers come in a one-and-a-half-point favorite. You know what? Give me the Bengals. I think the Bengals are right there. They feel like they're right there. I mean, they're putting up huge stats, huge stats, and just not finding the win. At some point, I think that changes. I think they start to find the wins, and they become the Bengals that we've known. They kind of remind me of... Uh, the Chiefs, was it last year? Where the Chiefs kind of like were, they, they didn't look great, and then they got to the playoffs and they were the Chiefs. They had more success with wins, but I feel like that's kind of what the Bengals are. Like, I'm not doubting the Bengals are a good team. I've just yet to see them put it all together. I think we will see it as the season progresses. Give me this one, national televised game, playing a good opponent on the road, I just feel like they're going to make a statement in this game. And then Monday night, oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, Houston Texans taking on the Dallas Cowboys. Give me the Texans. They're a seven and a half point favorite. I think it should be bigger than that. I think it's going to be a complete just slap down. And the Cowboys, I 
oof, it's bad. It is really, really bad for the Cowboys this season, and uh, their schedule does not uh, favor them in this matchup at all. So, yes, Cowboys going to take another L, and Houston will uh, move to 7-4 and four after this one. By weeks in week 11, New York Giants will be off. The Arizona Cardinals will be off, which for them kind of sucks because they're playing really good right now. That's not when you want to have a bye. You don't want to have that disrupted, but unfortunately they will. Uh, Buccaneers also will be off, and the Carolina Panthers also with the Panthers. They've kind of been looking better. Probably don't want to be off right now. Um, Coming back in Week 12, the Giants and the Buccaneers will actually play each other, and that will be in New York. And then in week 12, when the Cardinals return, they will be taking on the Seahawks. And the Carolina Panthers will come out of their bye week taking on the Chiefs. So will the Chiefs be coming off a loss or will they be 10-0? and And Carolina is going to look to shock the world. You know, we'll find out. But uh, yes, those are the four teams that if you have any fantasy players on those four teams, adjust your lineups accordingly. Let's get to the head-to-head matchup here between the Detroit Lions and the Jacksonville Jaguars, as we always do. We're going to go one by one here, and then we'll break it all down at the end. Detroit Lions, offensive passing, yes, they have the advantage. Not by as much as you would think, though. That's kind of surprising. Got to be honest. I would have expected a bigger uh, advantage. But don't forget, Jared Goff really got shut down that week against Tennessee and just took another kind of shutdown uh, against Houston. So two weeks where he has been a little under the under the the numbers that you would expect, and so that's probably a big part of why we're showing that here. Passing touchdowns, Lions have 18. The Jacksonville Jaguars have 11. Rushing yards, Detroit Lions, 1,326. Almost 300 yards more than the Jacksonville Jaguars. Rushing touchdowns, Lions have 15, Jaguars have 10. Total yards, Lions have about 300 yards more than the Jaguars. Points forced, you can see the Lions, 284 points scored by them, 202 for Jacksonville. Penalties, Lions have had 59 penalties called against them, Jacksonville had 57. Quarterback ratings, a big advantage here. Lions, basically Jared Goff is 104.4. For the Jaguars, I kind of had to split it between uh, Mac Jones and Trevor Lawrence. So together, they have an 83.8 quarterback rating. We'll see who plays against the Lions on Sunday. Interceptions thrown by the quarterbacks, 9 for the Lions, 8 for the Jaguars. Times sacked, the Lions have been sacked 19 times. Jaguars have been sacked 23 times. Fumbles lost, Lions have just one fumble lost this season. Jaguars have seven. On third downs, the Lions are 44%. Jaguars are 33. Fourth down, Lions are 58%. Jaguars are 50. And in the red zone, the Lions are 64%. Jaguars are 58. Both teams pretty decent in the red zone. Field goals. Lions are still a perfect 100%. Jaguars 93%. Now let's go to the defensive side of the ball. Passing yards allowed. Lions 2,198. Jacksonville 2,612. Passing touchdowns. Lions have allowed seven passing touchdowns. Jacksonville has allowed 19. Rushing yards allowed. Lions, 907. Jaguars, 1,294. Rushing touchdowns. Lions have allowed five. Jaguars, 11. Total offensive yards allowed. Lions have allowed 3,105. Jaguars, 3,906. Almost 800-yard difference. Points allowed. Lions have allowed 171 points. Jaguars, 264. Almost 90 points more. 
quarterback ratings allowed. So how quarterbacks perform against these defenses. Lions, 75.1. That is the best in the NFL. Jaguars, 106.2. Defensive interceptions. Lions have intercepted the ball from the opponent 13 times. Jaguars, just five. Sacks. Lions have sacked the quarterback 24 times. Jaguars have sacked the opposing quarterback 21 times. Defense on third down. Lions allow uh, third down conversions just 31% of the time. Jaguars, 44%. Fourth downs, Lions, 40%. Jaguars, 62%. And then in the red zone, the Lions, 44%. Jaguars, 61%. Quarterback hits on the quarterback. Lions, 60 quarterback hits this season. Jaguars, 42 Tackles for loss, Lions 44, Jaguars 51. So if we go head-to-head -head on offense, look at this. 13 categories on the offensive side of the ball for the Lions, just two for the Jaguars. What two? Well, they have less penalties by two, and they've thrown one less interception. So even those, they barely took those categories. Defensively, just as one-sided. Lions, 13 categories out of 14. Jaguars get one category, and it's tackles for losses, which they get by seven more tackles for losses than the Lions. Guys, this is going to be an absolute, I think, beatdown. You hate to get that confident, but, boy, everything that we've seen from these two teams this year and everything that we just see in these stats tells me it's going to be a slug fest from one side to the other. So real quick, I want to remind you guys how you can reach the show. Contact us through email, heavyhitterspodcast at gmail.com, or you can call the hotline 1-616-258-6386. Go check out all our shows at heavypodcast.com. And don't forget, if you like what I'm doing, you want to help support the the, uh, the network, you can always tip the host by going to Venmo and searching at Mario Romanelli or just scanning the QR code there at the right-hand side of the screen. And don't forget, when you check out our shows, please make sure you like, share, and comment on every show that you check out from us. It helps the algorithms, and I appreciate it very, very much. That's going to do it, guys. Another show in the books. Another NFL week down. I can't believe we are talking now about week 11 coming up. I mean, this season is flying by. But, boy, there are some key matchups this week. And then to just look at teams like the Dolphins, who you think or were thinking, hey, they're done. You know, they're, they're out of it. There's a lot of bad teams in the NFL this year. I think there's more bad teams than good teams. And so that's why a lot of these teams that got off to rough starts or had injury issues, all of a sudden, they still have the opportunity to get back into these playoff races. So we're going to find out, see what happens. But uh, the Baltimore Steelers game, that's going to be just a, a great matchup. And then the Chiefs and the Bills is going to be another one that's just going to show us where these two teams stand. And with the Ravens taking on the Steelers, that's even more important because you've got the Chiefs taking on the Bills. So really, the four best teams in the AFC possibly, I think a lot of people would agree with that, are going to be going head-to-head. -head and, and a couple of them going to take some L's, which could be huge to these teams coming up trying to still fight for a playoff spot. So kick back and enjoy the weekend. It's going to be a good one. And don't forget, Thursday night kicks us off with the Washington Commanders visiting the Philadelphia Eagles. That is another one that I just cannot wait to see. That's going to do it. And until next time, guys, uh, don't forget to take care of yourselves and each other. And don't forget, go check out Red Dot Truth. That is a major, major show that I really want to get out to everybody. And that one, please... Please share that show. 
with everybody you know. It's too important not to get that message out. And uh, the sooner we can get that message out, the better. So I just want to thank you guys so much and have a good night.